Hey, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Mitch Taco Bell. I'm your host with Tall Tales with Taco. It is May 2nd, and if you guys don't know what that day is, let me show you uh, what a great day it is. And by the way, this podcast tonight is being uh, pre-recorded so that we could have it on hand and celebrate, but there you go. Hide and Seek Champion 2001 to 2011 is no longer in existence. He is not the winner. So today, May 2nd, we all celebrate the final resting. Um, how do I say this without getting blocked? Let's just say that he is no longer the reigning champion of hide and seek. But, um, you know, my dad, when an airplane crashes or something happens, my dad will call me up and he'll ask me, hey, son, what do you think happened? And I'm like, I have no clue, Dad. You know, we have to wait till the final investigation comes out. They locate the black boxes, whatever. Um, that is really a, a true tale. Uh, you, you never know. You can speculate and you can make up stuff all you want. But what really infuriates me, over the years, I watch case after case after case of a false narrative being presented to the media. The media taking this false narrative and then run it out to the public. So this person gets slammed, um, ostracized and convicted in the court of public opinion before they even have a day in court. Tonight, my guest, uh, Fred Galvin, is joining us and he's going to talk about his day in court and how it actually turned great. There is so much about the story that's going to make you so mad. But uh, I appreciate you guys joining us tonight. And without further ado, Fred, I can't thank you enough for uh, coming out and hanging out with us tonight. Thanks, Taco. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'll tell you what. Yesterday when we were sitting in my man cave talking, I'm like, okay, this is going to be good. This is really going to be good. And then when I started diving into your story, I'm like, where the hell was I when this first happened in 2007? And I was thinking back on some of the stuff I was doing. And then uh, down there in Lejeune, I was probably in Lejeune the same time you were uh, getting ready for our deployment to Afghanistan in 2008, in like February of 2008. But, um, you know, before we start off on the meat of the story, you're from Kansas. Take us back a little bit. Uh, Join the Marine Corps at age. Okay. Yes, I grew up in Kansas and uh, played sports, went to a uh, all boy Catholic uh, Jesuit school and uh, played football, ran track. I wanted to join the Marines since I was 10 years old. Uh, what made you went... What made you want to join the Marines? Was there somebody that you met or? Well, uh, it wasn't in particular the Marines. Uh, our family went to these East Coast Revolutionary and Civil War battlefields. And it really was remarkable that uh, the sacrifices that these Americans had made for our initial freedoms and then the freedoms of every American, um, it really touched my heart. And uh, ever since I was 10 years old, I was like, I, I can't believe that, but I want to, I want to serve in, in the military. And then in high school, a friend of mine told me like, well, if you really want to be the first to fight, you got to join the Marines. They're the first ones in. And that was in 1987. <laughs> One of the Marines' mottos back then it still is, but uh, they really marketed it was the first to fight. And uh, so a week after graduating high school, I went to San Diego, MCRD, uh, Marine Corps Recruit Depot, out, uh, and I served at, deployed to a Desert Storm with Regimental Landing Team 5. We came back from that, and then I uh, attended the university, graduating at uh, Cal State San Marcos. I stayed out there in California due to a girl and uh, <laughs> I wanted to go back in the Marines. She had other plans. So I became a stockbroker for two years, uh, worked with Smith Barney, primarily selling stocks, little options. And uh, I've continued to do that over the years. But uh, following that, I went back in the Marines, got a commission and went back uh, to the West Coast as an infantry officer and a platoon commander. And then I moved over to Okinawa and became a force reconnaissance platoon commander. And that at that time was the Marine Corps most elite. Uh, I served over there 
for uh, two years as a deep reconnaissance platoon commander for the third marine expeditionary force and then we did two back-to-back -back deployments on uh, the 31st marine expeditionary unit the, the ships that go out on patrol in the western pacific uh, i did two of those six months patrols as a force recon platoon commander and then they sent me to yuma arizona uh, not too willingly i was a single man and didn't uh realize what I was really going to uh, be able to apply later. Uh, that's the Marine Corps version of Top Gun, as, as you know, Taco. You're hanging out and, with a uh, bunch of gold wingers, baby. Yeah. Yes. Gold Sweet wingers of a different wing. sort. Yes. <laughs> so, and well, then uh, that led us up to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan in 2002. I was early paroled from Yuma, uh, uh, which was a old uh, prison way back when. And uh, but left there and went to First Force Reconnaissance Company in Camp Pendleton, and uh, the war kicked off. And uh, we deployed to Iraq in 2003, 2004, 2005, and then the Marine Special Operations Command stood up in 2006. And our task force was the very first Marine Special Operations Company to deploy uh, to combat. And we went over to Afghanistan, and that's where this story really begins. Yeah, that's incredible. So if people don't realize when we talk about Delta Force or we talk about Navy SEALs, recon, force recon, they're they're they get so much of the same training, right? Yes. Um, we do attend many of the same schools um, before the advent of Marine Special Operations Command. Uh, we didn't receive quite the same level of funding, so we were not resourced to the same level, but we were very well resourced. But uh, our training was, you know, it exceeded the standards of what regular tier two uh, units and uh, white soft, such as Navy SEALs and Army Green Berets. I would uh, put us toe to toe. And uh, I've seen over the years, I mean, I did six uh, close quarter battle packages and deployments overseas and we could shoot better than any of uh, the Green Berets, any of the SEALs. Uh, we could uh, do deep reconnaissance better. That was our bread and butter, our true hallmark was, uh, we call it green side, uh, deep reconnaissance. And that was uh, what really differentiated us. And uh, yeah, those recon Marines are world-class. They truly are. I mean, that's, that's a tall order to put up against some, uh, you know, my buddies that I know that are SF and, and Delta down the street and the whole nine yards, uh, I bet yes. they'd be like, oh, no. But you know what? We are Marines, and Marines are special. And by God, we've got egos that are about that big. And yes. and there's actually a lot of justification behind it as well. I, I used to have this cartoon. This kind of showed the Marine Corps. There's this infantry guy sitting in a, in a, a foxhole. And it's starting to rain. He goes, God, this sucks. And then the next frame is this recon dude. And it's raining harder. And he goes, God, I love how much it sucks out here. And then you see this force recon guy. Snake's about to bite him. The water's up to his neck. He goes, God, I wish it would suck here more. And then you see this pilot flying overhead. He's nice and dry. And he's eating a candy bar. And he goes, God, I bet it really sucks down there. <laughs> so, I mean... Joking aside, you, you saw that when you were at Yuma and you got to hang out with the uh, air assets and the uh, aviators and gold wings. But all, all do all respect. Hats off for, for all recon guys and what they go through. They are incredible. So you do all of this build-up training. Were you, you were in charge of this training, uh, if I remember right, on your resume. That's correct. I designed the training uh, for our platoons and force reconnaissance, executed the training with the Marines, uh, and then same uh, was the case in Marine Special Operations Command, which is now the Marine Raiders. Uh, they had a name change right around 2014. But uh, I designed the, the training uh, life cycle of what we would do for our company and uh, went out there and executed the training with the Marines. Same thing when we went into combat is uh, plan the missions. We would execute the, the missions that we would plan and that's where uh, the main focus of this book is, is on one of those missions, a couple of them uh, that we planned. So 
if the listeners and, and viewers of your podcast really enjoyed both American Sniper and A Few Good Men, this is both of those stories combined with a, a big twist and on steroids. So there's a lot of combat action from both the uh, battles in Iraq, the battles in Afghanistan, and then this was the largest uh, number of alleged uh, civilians killed by direct fire weapons in the war in Afghanistan. They alleged we killed 19, wounded 50 others, a total of 69, completely false, and it was proven as such. And then also this was the longest trial in Marine Corps history uh, that was done right there in Camp Lejeune from 7 to 29 January 2008, right when you were there, Taco, in Camp Lejeune. Yeah. So. Good God. You know, I don't. All right. Looking at some of the write ups about your history and when you got down to Marsoc, they didn't even give you a detailed plan on where you were going to deploy. They just said, get spun up and get ready. Right. Right. Now, and that's a. Uh, Complete opposite. That, that's such a flaw in the in the uh, scheme of things. Commander's intent's one thing. Uh, hey, Fred, I need you to get your boys spooled up. They're going to be going yeah, at least. Hey, they're going to Sangin or they're going to Jalalabad or they're going to, you know, Haditha. But uh, not to give you a theater and not to give you a mission, to me, is just gross negligence. I mean, I'm just looking at it. Yes. From a These military not, point of view, right. Forces in the special operations community are not general purpose forces. They don't, uh, when a, as a few examples, when a Green Beret finishes his school and gets his actual Green Beret, and they say, hey, you're going to go to fifth special forces group in camp in Fort Campbell, uh, Kentucky, he knows exactly, uh, okay, fifth group goes to Iraq. Uh, when someone, seventh group in Fort Bragg, they get their green bread. They know I'm going to Afghanistan at, during those those decades of war. Uh, Navy SEALs, it's the same way. When they get their trident pinned on their chest, before they even check into their unit, they know this particular SEAL team is going to deploy. They don't have a 10-digit grid. They know exactly where and when they will deploy. And that affects the type of training, the type of equipment, the type of organizational structure uh, it uh, impacts the entire training life cycle for that group of SEALs or Green Berets, and it should have for us. Uh, we, we received zero guidance, although, you know, I as the unit leader was continually asking, and who was I asking? Well, the battalion above did not exist until four months after uh, we had been organized. So I was asking the commanding general, I had direct liaison authority directly to the Marine Special Operations Commanding General, and he's very indifferent, nonchalant as far as, uh, well, you're going to get on the boat and, you know, whatever happens, happens. And uh, that's to, to understand that these Marines will go to war somewhere and to not basically give a damn on where they will go. And, and I asked three specific questions. What will our mission be? And I didn't need to spelled out, but are we going to be training other foreign militaries? Will we be focused on direct action? Will we be doing deep reconnaissance? That type of mission statement, that broad guidance is critical. Uh, we didn't get that. I also asked who is going to be our next, when we go forward, who will we work for? So I can, un, so I can meet with them, get their guidance sure. now 11 months out, you know, we're just formed. I need to know who will work for. So, we are a good fit and a good match with our training, with our equipment, how we're organized. And then I also wanted to know which sub-region of cent Central Command, whether it's going to be Iraq, Afghanistan, will be the Horn of Africa, um, received no guidance. And these were, you know, my three, I submitted them as commander's critical information requirements for a year, weekly briefed. I'd like to know the answers to these. And But at that time, um, Rumsfeld, I believe they were hoping that uh, this whole thing would go away. Uh, the Marine Corps didn't want this to begin with. Rumsfeld in 2001 wanted increased capacity from all the different services. And that's exactly what happened. SEALs 
increased. They created SEAL Team 7 and SEAL Team 8, one on one team on both coasts. The, the Green Berets created an additional battalion per Special Forces group. The Marine Corps sat it out and said, hey, what we'll do is we'll send a few Marine officers as liaisons down to Tampa, Special Operations Command. And then we'll slow roll this even more when we get another nudge. And they created the Marine Corps Special Operations Command Detachment 1 is a is another slow roll effort to create a two-year proof of concept to even see if these Force Recon Marines could compete with Green Berets or SEALs. And um, of course, that proof of concept went to Iraq and the Marines did exceptionally well. Uh, and who was who the, the judge of that? I mean, uh, Army, I mean, you're in a joint environment. So who yes. who would be the the judge of that? How well you guys do? Well, actually, the commanding officer of the that detachment one, as they call it, Colonel Bob Coates, he uh, he was organized and deployed in support of Naval Special Warfare Group One. Um, but they had glowing reviews. And that's one of the things that I believe, you know, if things could have changed, if we had uh, someone higher rank than just a major, you know, we were working for a colonel. Uh, they sent in 2003 when the uh, detachment one deployed, uh, they had a full bird colonel as overhead for the Navy captain and someone of the similar of, of the equivalent rank. Uh, but when I was sent forward working for an Army colonel, uh, Green Bray colonel, of course, that's, Taco, that's like if you brought your girlfriend home to meet your wife. I mean, here's this competition. Uh, of course, there's going to be inter-service rivalry and that all the other people are going to be like, hey, this this major and his married men are trying to compete against missions from against me. Uh, so there was a lot of saboteurs early on, uh, both in the Army Green Bray side as well as on the Marine Corps side. The Marine Corps, uh, again, I go back to, they were resisting and saying, hey, we don't want, uh, we're going to slow roll this. We, they thought there was an assumption that Bush Jr., number 43, would have was going to be a one-term president like his father. And that didn't happen. He got reelected. Rumsfeld stayed on as his secretary of defense. And, you know, so what... Uh, what went on is Rumsfeld in 2005 said, Marine Corps, you are going to stop slow rolling this. You're going to stand up Special Operations Command, the Marine Special Operations Command. And he actually came to Camp Lejeune, <laughs> Dr. Wow. Rumsfeld, Sec Def, came there as basically the godfather. He made comments and he officiated this, uh, this wedding of Special Operations Command and the Marine Corps. And we were essentially, Fox Company was the first to deploy. So we are essentially this love child that both Special Operations Command and the Marine Corps wanted to abort. And even if we had to die on the operating table, they were willing to do that. And that's how we were not provided with the material, the manpower. Uh, we were, you know, hey, operate on this little undefined circle out in the top of the tour bores. Make sure you have a quick reaction force, but we're not going to give you any helicopters to get up there. Uh, so this catch 22. Uh, sure. You know. No, I mean, well, you had no logistics reading all the stuff about you. Right. You had absolutely zero help on logistics. You had made some liaisons with some of the army guys to be able to horse trade for some stuff and until they sent you just flour and oil. Like what the hell are you going to do with that? Make your own pan bread. But uh, yes, how did, so you guys were on a boat. How did you get into country? It's landlocked. So did you, did they fly your okay. equipment in or did you come in through Pakistan? Uh, we did fly in. So as it was mentioned in the uh, activation ceremony by, of course, a four star general, even though your special operations command commanding general like D General Doug Brown was, he stated in the activation ceremony in Marsoc in February 2006 that when they reached the 31st parallel, they will become operationally controlled by the theater special operations command. So I. I wanted to find out what this Rumpelstiltskin secret meant. I looked in there. Okay, that parallel means we're going to cross the Suez Canal. And bingo, we're going to be working for the Special Operations Command Central Command. Uh, so we did, as soon as we crossed through the Suez Taco, just like he prophesied a, a year ahead of time. So February 2007, one year almost to the date of us being, of the MARSOC being activated, we landed in Djibouti on the Horn of Africa and flew from Djibouti just our company, 
our task force straight into Bagram. And from Bagram, we pushed out to Jalalabad Airfield. And from there, we occupied two bases, one there at the Jalalabad Airfield and another south in the base of the Torbor Mountains at Kagiani. Was that so the we French operated base? There. Was Go that ahead. like an old French base? It was. It was a was French that, Special Operations Forces base, yes. Was that the one, the unit that got slaughtered? Uh, they weren't paying the Taliban and the Taliban wiped them out? Or was that you know, I had not heard that before. So they could have, but that's news to me. So. Oh, yeah, this is going back to briefs at the embassy. Um, so you guys you guys road trip all the way from Bagram, which is a long, long ways over to Jalalabad. And then you uh, finally get set up, or did they fly you we over? We flew. Yes, oh, we okay. flew. Well, what about vehicles? How'd they hook you up with uh, vehicles and... Yes, we had, uh, we weapons. had our own, but then they also gave us some heavier armored vehicles that uh, were a little bit more or less balanced. So if you drove more than 20 miles an hour and did any turns, it's more susceptible to rolling. Roll over. So, yeah. So, and then that goes to back to exactly what I had mentioned before is I had been requesting for 11 months before we deployed on who we were going to work for, where we were going to go so we could adapt our training, uh, but to fall in on vehicles in February in the Tora Bora Mountains, this is the most formidable train in the world right there, the Khyber Pass. Uh, yeah. But to not have uh, access to that equipment to conduct that training, it truly is like you mentioned earlier, that's truly, this gross negligence. Incredible. And you're putting Marines' lives at great risk when you're operating on this undulating train uh, day and night. Um, it's snowing, the snow's melting, causing a lot of mud. Uh, you're operating I mean, the tour bores covered in snow goes up to 14,000 feet. And they want us up in the top of there. Uh, we'd been training in Camp Lejeune flat as a pancake. Uh, <laughs> so it's not exactly set up for success and notice. But it sounds like they, they intended that. Yes. Look where the blame ended. Nobody above myself, uh, the battalion commander. Nope. Uh, Marsoc commander. Nope. Uh, Special Operations Command, no. It was all yeah. placed down at the tactical level. Like, you screwed this up. Uh, you know, we had some vehicle rollovers while we were there in Afghanistan. Oh, that's that's the commander's fault. Was that commander allowed to conduct training uh, that mirrored where he was going to go in the type of vehicles that he was provided in that theater? No. No, uh, well, you so, didn't know where you're going. Yes, it's a... But, all right, so so you get there, over, overcome, adapt, improvise our motto right and right. you've got these vehicles you're in there in february it's um the fight season hadn't kicked off yet you kind of get the lay of the land you're the new guys in town you got two months you did like 38 missions if i remember right that's great um how did those go pretty successful right they were you know we were trying to collect information uh every single day you know i had been an instructor out there in Yuma at the Marine Corps version of Top Gun. So I knew not just slightly, I'd been a force recon platoon commander in two separate commands, one in the Pacific wow. operating all over the Pacific and one uh, for the rest of the duration of I was a captain, constantly conducting uh, deployments over to Iraq in, in a high intensity environment uh, where we are using massive amounts of joint and Marine Corps aviation assets. So they told us to get on top of these mountains. So we requested a visual reconnaissance. They approved a mission. Every mission after that, denied, denied, denied. So they wanted us to get on the top there because we thought, you know, we we struck it rich when, oh, that's the last place Osama bin Laden had been f spotted is on top of the Tora Bores right. during out Operation Anaconda. So we thought like, well, then I quickly realized like, if this was so juicy, why the, the Army? Why aren't the Army and the uh, Navy SEALs up there? Yeah, they'd have their Green Berets up there. But yeah. after the Marine Corps paved, or not the Marine Corps, but the United States paid for this nice paved highway from that connected the capitals of Afghanistan and Pakistan, well, that's where the opium and poppy was being exported and the foreign fighters were being uh, brought in. So there was no reason to try to summit 14,000 feet of snow-covered peaks when you could just use a high-speed road you know, to go in and out easily. Uh, susceptible to bribery uh, but yeah. uh 
Yeah, so that's uh, we found that out very, very quickly that, hey, OK, there's a there's this is really, you know, a paper tiger, a red herring. They're, right. they're putting us up there in the top of mountains like they did the French. You know, the French, uh, they were more than happy to, you know, treat it like it's the Alps in the wintertime and, and go hike around and do some little recce. But I had uh, an additional constraint put upon me by Colonel Haas, who is the, the commanding uh, officer of the, the Green Braves, the Joint Special Operations Task Force. He said, Fred, we cannot afford to have another screw up like Operation Red Wings, which is the story that uh, Marcus Luttrell was involved in, where the team was compromised just north of there in Asadabad in 2005. And then following their compromise, emergency extract aircraft uh, that was there as a quick reaction force was shot down. So they said, you need to have a quick reaction force able to immediately push in there. So, But uh, every day I was requesting, personally myself as the commanding officer, requesting aviation assets to to insert our teams. Our teams had been training there in Jalalabad to insert every single time uh, the the colonel's staff denied, 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 denied any aviation assets. But then they were saying, you need to get up there in the top of those mountains. Why aren't you up there in the top of those mountains? Why aren't you doing what the colonel wanted? Well, he specifically said, get there? right. Yeah, you know, we, we have to be able to get there and we have to be able to immediately reinforce. So if you provide no aircraft, we can neither get to the top of the mountains nor be able to reinforce, which was one of his requirements. It wasn't Fred Galvin's desirement. It was, you know, levied upon me. You you shall have a quick reaction force be able to immediately reinforce that. So on the 4th of March, that's we were doing a threefold mission it was one. I was doing a face to face liaison with an army command that's right there at the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan at the Torkham Gate. And there was a female uh, army lieutenant. She ran that uh, platoon of military police. Mm -hmm. It was at that border checkpoint. And I was doing a face to face to ensure that we would be able to stage a platoon of our personnel to be able to quickly react. And then following that, the second phase of that three phase mission was to conduct you know, vehicle patrol to see how far we could. I mean, these these are completely snow covered mountains and we'd been doing imagery analysis and we had seen nothing at all as far as any footprints or rat trails or let alone. I mean, the, the snow starting to melt. So it's it's coming down fairly heavily, uh, right. but we just couldn't get our vehicles up there. Uh, and this is like thick, thick, deep snow, as you've seen in some of these images. But uh Part of the problem is if you can't get up there, uh, I mean, we, we were making our effort. I'll leave it at that. And then, then the third part of our uh, three-part patrol was uh, one thing that interfered between uh, our base in Jalalabad and where we were going to stage the quick reaction force was this, the first village inside Afghanistan, which was called Badi Ko. And we had collected very reliable corroborated by multiple sources, intelligence that there was four fully trained suicide bombers in that village. And so we were going to go in, uh, in Iraq, we would have been able to go in and immediately, you know, apprehend them or go after them. Uh, in Afghanistan, we started playing with these NATO rules of engagement, the play nice, the wind in the hearts and minds, the yeah. General Mattis coin first do no harm. So we were to go in and do this uh, meet and greet the tribal elders talk and kind of suss out and hopefully they would give us something we knew they wouldn't. Uh, but as we rolled through there earlier that morning to go meet the uh, army lieutenant, it was the norm, this village that we passed through body co the normal pattern of life, men, women, children, hustle and bustle, this busy bazaar where they were buying and selling goods came back through three hours later, totally different bazaar. Stuff only like men, military-aged men, sat on this side of the road, uh, lined up like a parade. As we came in there, we knew the atmospherics drastically changed. I said over the radio, watch out, and boom, our second vehicle got detonated. A, a van filled with explosives detonated point-blank right in the front bumper of that uh, vehicle number two. Uh, so we came did, to what we call take, Go ahead. Did it take out the uh, – how was the uh, turret gunner? So the Marine and the turret, we, we – 
our per, my perception was that that vehicle was completely destroyed. This was the largest car bomb I've ever seen. And I've been to Iraq several times at this point. This was a massive fireball and huge explosion, scorched the trees over 100 foot above. And wow. myself as a commander watching this, this happened at nine o'clock in the morning. I thought, my God, we've lost all five Marines in that truck. And they went through the blaze. Uh, surprisingly, afterwards, a vehicle came from the south side of the road, a uh, sports utility vehicle. Uh, three jihadists were outside of the windows firing AK-47s in uh, coming perpendicular to T-bone and finish up, attempt to finish off that vehicle, that Humvee of ours that just got blown up. Our, the turret gunner who had been hit, he stood up inside the turret, extinguished the flames that were on his vest, uh, manned the medium machine gun, aimed in and uh, started firing to kill the uh, three jihadists that were firing at him. The uh, Marine in the back troop compartment of that vehicle, that was, I believe, and I can only uh, assume, that vehicle was not fully encased uh, like some of the other Humvees. That was right. an ambulance variant, so it had an open back on it uh, so we could load patients in there. But uh, right. so because it's not fully encased, one of our Marines in the back troop compartment stood to his feet with a light machine gun and also uh, joined in the turret gunner to uh, destroy the uh, jihadists in the vehicle. And that's the one uh, picture that was flooded all over the media that had that blue sports utility vehicle, the toy. Oh, it had auto. rounds all over it. Right. It had rounds. It oh, two, all the rounds all through it, yes. the windshield and everything. Yes. Two Marines firing fully automatic at a vehicle you know, driving directly at them immediately stopped that vehicle. The driver of that vehicle, that blue Toyota Prado, bailed out into a ditch. Uh, we later on, and I'm going to fast forward real quickly here. Later on, when my vehicle passed, we saw the, the driver stand up with an AK-47 shooting at us. The gunner in our vehicle shot at the, but missed. Uh, the jihadists shooting at us, but that same individual that was shooting at us, that I, we drove right by him, he was shooting at us. I saw him. Yeah. Uh, he was a witness and was testifying that uh, he was innocent. I mean, but <laughs> there, there's a lot in between. You know, a, a year later when we went to court, um, you know, the prosecution was treating him with kids' gloves. Thank you for your service. And, you know, these Marines did something terrible. And, uh, you know, he admitted was this he was BTC a or did they bring this idiot over to the states to testify against you? They brought him to a Jalalabad Air Base and uh, testified video teleconference. And uh, they they paid him salacia payments. Um, you know, he demanded more justice. He said he had ten thousand dollars. You know, I had a automatic teller machine business after I retired from the Marines. He said he jammed five hundred Afghanis. That's their currency. Uh, a massive amount of paper currency in his glove compartment. Of course, he said he wanted that and the damage to his vehicle. And uh, he changed his story. He first told the NCIS that he had three, there was four people in the vehicle, him one, that three of them were killed. And then he realized later uh, during the trial that we probably could figure out who one of the, because one of those was a known jihadist uh, on a terror list. Uh, so he changed his story when he went under oath, when he swore on the Quran and to, to Allah, he says, uh, he, he swore that he's telling the truth, that there was only two people in the vehicle with him and they were both killed, but he received payment for three uh, a year before. Uh, so, but this is who and, the and prosecution if, 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 believed. Yeah, people don't realize in Afghanistan, when we made a mistake, like we did in 2008, we bombed a um, wedding party we were tracking on uh, video uh, with a, a drone or something. We were tracking some bad guys, and the bad guys end up, it's nighttime, and they end up at a big, large tent with armed guards all around it. And they went in, and everyone thought they're having a bad guy meeting, and they dropped a bomb on that, on that tent. Turned out to be a wedding party, but, you know, their culture is invite anybody who comes, and uh, if you come in, we accept you. Um, Boy, we paid a lot of money, but there was, we would pay like $200 per death, I think, per right. body. 
And they would go out and they would, they would claim that we had killed 30 people. And yet they would go out there and they would take ground sensing radar and, you know, be goats buried or dogs or washing machines or whatever. And there weren't bodies, but we would have to pay out to satisfy the elders. I mean, it was just a game. It was, it was such a, uh, um, extortion game that the Afghans yes. were very successful at. So this guy, this guy claimed three, then two, and then what did the prosecutor do? Well, the prosecutor and the colonel, the head of the court, uh, were very sympathetic. Oh, we're so sorry. And uh, this just goes to show that, you know, the, the nature. I mean, as you were just mentioning with the Salacia payments, in this case, they paid up to $2,300, which is the equivalent of up to four years salary of the average Afghan. So yeah. if you went to Dallas uh, and you just calculated the average four year salary of an American, at, you know, just over a quarter million dollars, um, there'd probably be more than 60 people lined up, uh, 69 people in a, any small village. If you didn't require any proof of anything and you're just like, Hey, we're going to pay. You just have to come in here and file a claim zero proof, which is what happened in this case, they zero proof the tribal elders came there and NCIS had told them uh, during their investigation, a lot of alleged eyewitnesses, they, these guys came to get more money and they said, do you have any more money? And they said, no, we're not, we don't do this. Alicia. We're doing an investigation. They said, so these guys left and some of them even admitted taco. They said, no, I was just told to come here by my tribal elder to try to get more money. And many of them confessed that, you know, we, nobody was actually killed. I just came here to get the money. And so, and so did they ever, did they ever produce bodies or evidence of, uh, innocent deaths? Yes. That brings up a very, very interesting topic. Two, two reasons why taco is in our case, although there's pictures later used that was not of on the 4th of March, some pictures were out there in the press that, People believed, but it was not of the 4th of March. So in our case, there was no bodies, no blood, no, no bullets recovered. And so they say, some, some have said, that's why we didn't go to a court martial, because there was no prima facie evidence against us. It was hearsay, it was conjecture, as he said, she said. So, but that could be true. I also believe in, I'm sure you've you know, familiarize yourself between a court martial and a court of inquiry. They tried a court of inquiry on us. And one of the main differences is there is no rules of evidence. And that sounds like I have to be embellishing. It sounds like, Fred, you're, what do you mean? No rules of evidence. You mean they can just present anything conjecture yeah. without any backup supporting evidence? Yes. It's yeah. much like a board of inquiry. If somebody's being kicked out of the military, they don't have to have any proof uh, now that will be debated and the panel members will be the ultimate determination of what's going on but uh there were we went through a court of inquiry and i believe and you don't have a, you don't have a, a jury of your peers either it's just a board of officers couple, right we had a board of officers that were none of which were from marsoc no they, they required them to be combat arms and to have combat experience and as you know, Taco, it, in my opinion, there's a big difference between going over to a combat zone and you can check the block, say, yeah, I've been in combat in a combat zone. And then there's a difference between seeing the face of the enemy. When you see someone who is firing, you see the sweat on their face. They're firing at point blank range at you. You're firing at them like a force recon platoon commander would have done or other infantry officers and many other people of other occupation, military specialties, but uh, often senior officers are not the ones out there pulling the slack out of triggers. And that's just not right. what they do. So to get a jury of our peers that have truly experienced that, you know, level of where the point of friction is and, uh, you know, the fog of war, you know, that's, I don't believe I mean, I believe one of the panel members was, and he's been a strong advocate. I believe the others had experience, but uh, there were no Marine Special Operations officers or Marine Raiders. Uh, that that didn't. There was not a true jury of our peers. 
No, Andrew, Andrew did a really great job of capturing your entire story in that five part series. Uh, yes. if, if I'll have to get it on there, but it's Andrew Grand Dupree. Andrew did I Grand that? Dupree. Yes. Yeah. So I pronounced you... that correctly. What, what are the things that struck me was the air force Colonel. What was his name? Pa uh, Piana, Pahana. Pahana. Pahana, Pahana. Yes. Yeah. So who was this guy? What <sighs> command was he attached to? And yes. why the hell is an air force guy? Pat coming yes. in there and even doing the investigation. What I mean, I I see your head spinning, Pat. Or I'm sorry, yeah. you asked to call yeah. it this investigating officer. Actually, asked myself and our our young Marines all the way to corporals and sergeants to call him Pat, and that's just, just call that's, me Pat. Yeah, that's totally unmilitary, and uh, it's a lack of tact and military discipline and good order. But I saw your head spinning there, Taco. Uh, you're retired Marine officer, senior officer, lieutenant colonel. And I believe why your head was spinning is you have experienced the unfortunate tragedies of class A and class B mishaps. I mean, these are thing, horrible things, but you would never have a supply officer or an infantry officer go in, you know, when unfortunately there was a Marine uh, C-130 that was flying some Marine Raiders and crashed in, in Mississippi and killed yeah. Uh, all the passengers that were on board. You didn't have a water. grunt. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't have a supply officer, no, nothing wrong with those, but you didn't have a communication officer because we're not qualified, right. but they sent this air force colonel to investigate us ironically. And I, I don't think there was, he was unqualified for what the intention was six months prior. There was a green Bray team, operational detachment team, three, seven, four, ODA team, which is the Greenberry teams are called. Uh, the investigating officer, Colonel Pahana. He was brought in again from all the way from Gutter in the Persian Gulf, in the Middle East, flown in. Uh, so this is kind of like a mob boss doing what the boss wants. Uh, he'll right. make all the facts align with what the boss is trying to get at. And he did a really good job, although the book, it, the reason it's a must read is what he confessed on the stand, and I believe. He, all these guys were protected every time that they knew a witness would probably stumble and fall on a sword or another witness for the defense would produce exonerating exculpatory evidence. They, they went to a closed session. This is, this is information warfare, which we're allowed to do on the enemies of the United States. We cannot do against our own military and we cannot do against the people of the United States. This was supposed to be a public hearing. I mean, this taco, this was, this is not, involving any submarines at sea or the locations of satellites and orbits or Jason Bourne's knock list. This was a gun battle on the side of the road. Right. So the reason, and, and as you know, the security classification guide forbids classifying any material on the basis of protecting someone from embarrassment. So why did that Colonel in the court who was presiding over this constantly, I mean, he was representing Mars, Marine Central Command, the convening authority, General Mattis, uh, during the investigation phase. And then later, uh, he and uh, there was a change of command. General Mattis turned, uh, turned over his command to General Helland, a, a pilot. And uh, but he was he was representing General Helland and General Helland, you know, was the convening authority, the one in charge. But the reason that the media was constantly escorted not just out of the courtroom in the lobby, but they brought them two buildings over and put them on the second floor. Yeah, classified during all the defense hearing continuously. So you didn't get to hear what Colonel Pahana said. The press didn't get to hear. The jury did. And the same thing about this uh, Marine who was born in Guadalajara, had moved, had legally immigrated, legally joined the Marine Corps. You know, his crime was he joined the Marine Corps and joined Force Recon, joined MARSOC. And he was driving the vehicle that got blown up. And so because he was born in Mexico, didn't understand all of the, the rights that he's afforded in the Constitution, that he and his family cannot have their citizenship revoked, whether he be native or naturalized citizen, you can't have it revoked. Uh, but they squeezed him. And these weren't NCIS. These were the prosecuting attorneys dressed in civilian clothes. This came out in the courtroom. And, and the Marine actually pointed at the prosecuting attorneys. They said, who signed, 
was your statement in Afghanistan true or was your statement that you made back in North Carolina true? Which one was it? Because they were different statements. In yeah. the second statement, they said, you know, the Marines were firing out of control. And he said, uh, those two officers there forced me to sign this manufactured statement stating that they would deport my mother. I mean, that kind of strong arm mob boss tactics, that kind of shit goes on in Tehran. It doesn't wow. go on in the United States of America. And that's illegal. That was used. Your readers need to read this book because if you're paying attention to what's going on in Russia in the demoralization of the military, the, the lack of trust of their citizens who did not know what was originally going on, that this yeah. they just called it a special operation. It was covered up by the entire military. And if if you don't think that we are susceptible to that kind of abuse of authority in the United States military and that we may very likely someday go to war in the few years from now against the Chinese, we have to have a military that is led by competent commanders that is, has a high morale and that is effective. And, and this is a cancer that if it's not treated, it will metastasize. So this is the largest employer in the United States, the department of defense. If you, until just recently, if you stacked Amazon and Walmart together until yeah. just recently, department of defense dwarfed both combined. Uh, so it affects more Americans than any other employer, but Walmart can't put, their employees on bread and water if they do something wrong and Amazon can't send them to prison or, or to death sentence like major Hassan Nadal, the former major who went on that shooting spree in Fort hood. Right. He's, he's sentenced to death and that will happen. Uh, but <clears throat> this oh, kind best, of abuse. Would, yeah. The best they can do is make, make those guys poop in bags and pee in the truck. You know, that's yes. uh, that's Amazon, but I mean, you're absolutely right. So where's the, I want to know accountability. Where were the Marines that were supposed to be taking care of my Marines down at Marsoc? Right. I mean, you're 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 this new command. You're this new entity that is going off to fight. You're going to make me proud as a as a Marine. Where are the where's the big brothers? Did you have any? Yes. Good good question. You, I mean, did you have any mentors, big brothers within the community to to help you? Yes, or? I, I did that. that but the, when Marsoc formed, they exclude a lot of these uh, strong mentors, like the gentleman I mentioned before, uh, Colonel Bob Coates. They didn't allow him to have any say. They, they excluded him from Marsoc, uh, right. as well as several other reconnaissance leaders who had strong backbones. I believe they didn't want these guys in to influence and to put roots down because I believe they intended. There was a reason why we didn't have initially any military construction. They didn't have any plan to develop any more equipment. I mean, we went from 300 force recon Marines to 2,650 MARSOC personnel. We're going to need additional equipment just because we are growing exponentially. So right. if, if you can figure this, um, the longest trial, I'm, I may mention the longest trial Marine Corps history, uh, right there in Camp Lejeune, 1.5 miles from the headquarters building one, which MARSOC was originally in, to where the courtroom was. And if you can put your hands together and put that over the head, that's exactly how many officers from MARSOC showed up on our war crimes trial during three and a half weeks, the longest trial in Marine Corps history, zero. So I thought at least one would come in there. Um, I mean, it's not a sign of innocence or guilt if you show up and, you know, listen to what's going on. I mean, it, I mean these are guys with top secret clearances. So, right. uh, but, uh, as far as none that said, hey, I'm with you. I got your back. And none of them made it, the phone calls, no no messages. Um, so it was really, truly uh, left on your own. This was a, a Home Depot, do it yourself. You're on your own, Major Galvin. And where uh, did they keep you? Did they keep you in the queue or were you in, in the brig with the other guys? No, our case, they didn't uh, confine anyone. Uh, we weren't restricted to our quarters. Uh, good question, though. And I'll elaborate on this here. So, you know, we were permanently assigned to Camp Lejeune. So I, I lived in a little uh, apartment out in Sneeds Ferry. But uh, during that time, so get this, Taco. I not only sent a, I mean, I had a sworn statement, but I made a, did a polygraph too. And the Marine Central Command, as well as Marine Special Operations Command, they both had 
the results of my polygraph test. And that's when it turned into investigations gone wild, where 45 criminal investigators and four prosecuting attorneys turned those 49 individuals turned on seven Marines. This is the grossest example of dogpiling. I mean, how do you think you'd survive, you know, seven to one odds? And then there was two of us that it narrowed down to that went into the courtroom and were actually the, the co-defendants, there's two of us. So 49 against two. And then ultimately they turned against just myself. Uh, later after the trial had uh, was over, I, I went to another trial. But uh, <clears throat> so- How, how about just, your attorneys? Did you have- uh... Like just some court appointed jag or did you well, hire originally during the whole thing the original article 15-6 we didn't have you know that said that <clears throat> they're turning it over to criminal investigation and we didn't have uh any military attorneys detailed to us at all not until october of 2007 so from when we returned home in april of 2007 we were kind of in limbo but we knew the Article 15-6 said that they recommended charges against us of negligent homicide. So that's punishable by death. Uh, sure. So I went and got uh, attorneys, uh, screened them all, all of the, all seven of us lawyered up. Um, a gentleman who was a Marine officer uh, accused falsely during the uh, Fallujah, um, Battle of Fallujah, Ilario Pantano. He had a legal defense oh, fund shoot. that he... Yeah, the, the guy he demoted right, accused him of shooting the guys in the back or something, right? Right. Uh, so he he financially supported the Marines. And then I uh, oh, awesome. had a – so we did all lawyer up. And then in October, when they brought it, two of us, myself and one other officer, into uh, the regional defense office in Camp, Camp Lejeune, that's when they said, okay, the two of you will be co-defendants and uh, – then they appointed military counsel at that time to the two of us. Uh, so, but of course, I'm sure you understand this isn't a, some minor jaywalking or seventh can of beer in the barracks when you can only have six. This is a serious, you know, this is something that every religion and every nation on the globe condemn is like one of the most heinous allegations. And, uh, you know, it was important to do what, take the actions that we did. So from March 4th, you're pulled out of country just a few days later. But who was, who was the guy uh, you were trying to clarify after that attack? Who was the guy that said um, sacrifice yeah. Marines for the greater good? Who was that guy? Okay, so now <laughs> there's this in this book does explain this in detail. And that's why I really whether some people like to listen and they want to get the audible or they want to read it. And there's, I'm going to get this it. book. This, I've got to get this book now. So. Yes. so what you're talking about, Taco, is, and this may sound crazy. I'm sure your listeners are probably going to be like, well, this guy, Galvin, is nuts. Uh, so I was cleared. We were exonerated. Uh, and it took the, the government four months, four months to deliberate. And, and you are an experienced officer. You realize that like, if you wait four months, that's, un, that's truly unheard of. Yeah. And then you dump it to one news source, the Associated Press. Mr. Estes Thompson gets this one sentence from the convening authority on Memorial Day weekend. So that's there's few holidays that the Pentagon truly goes down to a skeleton staff for the headquarters Marine Corps. And they, they put out this statement that the Marines acted appropriately according to the rules of engagement and tactics, <laughs> techniques, and procedure for a complex ambush. So that's what we call a Friday night news dump. That's when you want right. to bury something. You put it out on Friday. Everybody shows back up to work on Monday. Other things have happened over the weekend. This is old business. Uh, and you really don't even have to really answer the tough questions because there's been other things that have happened in the stock market and, and the regular news that have taken over the headlines. And this basically gets whitewashed and pushed out. But they waited four months to have one of those. As you know, after the holiday seasons, there's no long federal holidays until Memorial Day. And they right. waited until Friday night. They only they only dumped it to Estes Thompson. So, but I say that because as soon as we were cleared, then they sent me to another investigation. I had to wait six more months. Then they narrowed it down just to me uh, to kick me out of the Marine Corps. And then they dropped it right before the day before we were going to go into court. Uh, so I requested, hey, 
send me back to where I started in the reconnaissance community. Send me back over to Okinawa, Japan, where it all began. And uh, from Okinawa, Japan, I went on another deployment to Afghanistan. Now, this is where your listeners will probably think, this guy's maybe things aren't, you know, you just got a, a you know, you just you got, got leave on, one, on one op. Yeah. And you go back over. Yeah. So I not only, I mean, I go over to Okinawa, Japan, which I know a lot of Marines aren't rushing to, to get over to Okinawa, especially if you've been in a, I mean, I've been deploying since 2002 and now it's, yeah. 2009 and there's i mean i've been going this whole time uh so uh if you're in that kind of situation the the assignments officer the guy's telling you where to go in the marine corps it isn't going to say like hey i need you to go to the worst place over in okinawa japan but i chose to go there and from there i chose to go back on another deployment and that's the one that you're referring to just a minute ago where on that deployment the commanding officer uh we had he was making some the worst possible decisions. We had a reconnaissance platoon. This was in a reconnaissance battalion back in Afghanistan in Sangin Valley, which was the worst location as hell on earth at that time in 2011. And uh, <clears throat> while we were there, a uh, platoon got enveloped by the enemy, was getting hit by uh, AK-47s, medium machine guns, rocket propelled grenades, and uh, they were pinned down. We did not know in the battalion operations center that they were inside of this canal. They didn't report that. We didn't have imagery providing a feed to us that we could see that. And the platoon was in intense fire. So their job is to return fire. Uh, But they did not say that, hey, we are in what called defilade, like in a a covered position. And the battalion commander, I I made him aware that we have aviation above us. We had a Marine with this, uh, it's a KC-130. Marines went with a cheap option. We didn't have a like a specter gunship, like the Air Force Special Right, right. Yeah, you get our package in the back, yeah. Yes, but we have what's a, called the Harvest Hawk, which was a Griffin missile, which is equivalent of, it's essentially a laser-guided javelin missile. So it's a it's a anti-armor missile with four pounds of high explosives in the form of a shape charge that's used to defeat armored vehicles by using that shape charge to punch a hole and kill the in, insides of the target using overpressure. And of course, I I wasn't just a, a terminal air controller calling in airstrikes, which I had been to that school, but I was like the Uber uh, guy that when I was at the Marine Corps top gun school, this is what I specialize in is releasing yeah. aviation ordinance. It's the only place in the Marine Corps that you can drop it at what we call 0.1 probability of incapacitation, piece of I 0.1. Uh, and that's where we were doing it all the time at that close distance. That's what I was an expert in. Uh, so I told him we can use, we have an, a Marine a KC-130 with a, a Harvest Hawk, four pounds of high explosives. You can be used very precisely, closely used to with overpressure. So we're not blasting. And we also had Harriers with a 500 pound bomb. Right. Uh, that's blasting shrapnel three dimensionally. You cannot drop it within 180 meters. And then we also had uh, an armed drone uh, with a laser guided Hellfire. That's 10 pounds. It's a AGM 114K and the K model had uh, 10 pounds of high explosive. So you can use that very close. What is the battalion commander gets his ego involved? I'm going to drop the 500 pound bomb 34 meters away from our own Marines, 34 meters, five times inside the probability the acceptable fratricide limits of probability of incapacitation 0.1. Sure. Uh, the the orders wow. by the four star prohibited from dropping that within 180 meters. The battalion commander not only drops it anyway, disregards the, the four star general's orders. Uh, let's say paragraph four, compliance is mandatory. Right. Uh, I'm his operations officer stating we cannot do this, can't legally do this, but you're under Title 10 U.S. Code, you're the battalion commander, you're in charge. He drops it anyway. And uh, didn't actually the enemy had maneuvered because he waited 50 minutes, 50 minutes. These guys are pinned down, getting almost overran. Yeah. uh, Drops the bomb, hits another compound the enemy had vacated, and uh, the Marines are asking for more fire, fire support. The Harriers had checked off station. So we still had the armed drone, and we still had the KC-130 that had the Precision guided munitions able to be delivered by laser and or uh, GPS. 
yeah. uh, cause, you know, these are very non-invasive. What does the battalion commander do? Fires two HIMARS, surface-fired rockets, 675-pound warheads. Uh, again, you can't drop that. 225 pound, 225 pound warheads, I think. 675 pound, this variant. Uh, and he fired him an open sheath formation. So you can go on soft rep, type in Lieutenant Colonel Homiak, H O M I A K. You know, like Fred Galvin is uh, talking some stuff that's kind of bold. Not only is this in the book, you can watch it live on soft rep. Dot, dot, Type in S O F R E P homie hack and you know, leave it to recon Marines. They filmed this. So you <laughs> see this, these surface fired rockets, not just one, but two, and not in closed sheath formation where that I mean, these are driven by GPS. So they can land right on top of each other within one one meter. Right. But he dropped puts them in open sheath formation. So he spreads out these. This is the largest ordinance possible. These Marines are 34 meters away. That energy, we didn't know they were in a canal, but that energy still passes through their soft tissue. These Marines, the rest of their deployment, are not allowed to have screenings for traumatic brain issue, the injury to your soft tissue in your brain. One of these Marines was never able to get medical treatment later on, goes to the VA, they, they deny him any kind of medical treatment, he starts <clears throat> self-medicating, hangs himself later. Uh, this is a young Marine going who's going to school down in Louisiana, going to college. His girlfriend walks in and finds him uh, he hung himself. Uh, so, but this battalion commander, uh, awards himself a bronze star, never pulled the slack out of his trigger. He gets promoted to Colonel gets promoted, goes to top level school and, um, uh, he gets Oh six command of the Marine Raider training command. And then is now still in, uh, the Marine Corps at, uh, the senior Marine officer at Virginia military Institute. So, uh, these, these few bad men, if your listeners have a concern for our nation's defense, uh, it is very important to read this book. You can order it on Amazon. They will not yeah. charge uh, purchasers until it actually ships on this and they'll receive it on the seventh. Uh, you can get this in hardcover. You can get it to uh, an audible and you can get it uh, on uh, Kindle to where you can read it electronically. But it, it also, what I'm saying I fought for 11 years to have this information declassified. It finally has been declassified. It's been released to me. Uh, this has gone through the whole Pentagon pre-publication security review. And what you're going to read in the last half of the book is the verbatim transcripts of what these gentlemen who thought they'd be protected, what they said in the courtroom on the stand where the yeah. media was not there. So this is, if again, if you like combat action like an American sniper, if you like yeah. courtroom drama like a few good men. This is a twist of them both. You have a lot of combat action from Iraq and Afghanistan because it has the stories from when uh, I was a force recon platoon commander taking down ships. We took 39 ships down in the Gulf of Oman, Gulf Aden, Northern Arabian Gulf, yeah. combat operations in southern and western Iraq uh, for 2003, 2004, 2005. And then it talks about our combat deployment in uh, MARSOC is the first Marine Special Operations Task Force in western or in Eastern Afghanistan, and then it goes into the court. The end is the best. What is said in court, not by me, because it it starts just going what these individuals said and how they all fell on their sword, but none of them got punished. They all, I mean, so this battalion commander who's still in circulation, like I just described, he yeah. topped it off by saying, Fred, I'm willing to sacrifice the lives of these Marines and I need to make sure you will do the same in all future occasions. Meaning he wanted me to drop this heavy level of ordinance to potentially, and I, I knew as an instructor at Marine Corps Top Gun, that this is going to kill these Marines. It's registered yeah. in my head uh, through the training that I had. It's needlessly going to kill them. We have other options and we don't need to use the biggest. That, that doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, and a Marine did, you know, kill himself Ultimately after this. Died. Because he was negligently, he was, was not treated. Now we have a commanding officer. He didn't say that to me once. He said that to me twice. I said, I can't, what you've told me to do, sir. And I went back through the tail of the tape of exactly what happened. I said, it's registered is needlessly going to kill American Marines. And that is an unlawful order. And I have a duty to disobey. And he relieved me. And he sent me back to Okinawa. 
I went sent through another another trial to kick me out of the Marine Corps, which well, I won. And uh, then I was sent on to uh, command uh, the fleet anti-terrorism security teams FAST, which is a base, essentially the SWAT team for the Marine Corps, mm -hmm. um, where we were involved in a situation uh, the day after Benghazi where we uh, reinforced the American Embassy at Tripoli, American Embassy in the Regional Affairs Office uh, for 90 days with a fast platoon. But uh, this book explains uh, so much. And I think your listeners will love reading this or listening to it. Uh, oh, God, yeah. Everyone wow. has written blurbs on this book. Uh, and we have undersecretaries of defense, congressmen, uh, two movie producers, list goes on and on. Uh, professionals, they said, Fred, this book was very professionally written. So Sal Mana, who co-authored it, it's, it's easy to read. If you're like me, an infantry officer who just learned to walk upright and, uh, you know, it's it's easy to read. It's got pictures in there. So Marines that uh, like <laughs> like pictures, you can use crayons. These are black and white. Uh, it's a but it, it explains who oh, said this. I, and it's got a photo. Can, of. You can underline it with the green ones, but, you know, don't eat them because they're not right. Yes. Yet. Right. You won't hey, who, who, who are the two guys. Who are the two guys on the cover here? Why? Why did you get those guys? Okay, actually, this was the publisher's choice. Uh, the author doesn't have a choice on the cover. You have huh. an opinion. Uh, so the gentleman on the left, as you're looking at the book, is uh, General Amos. He was the Commandant of the Marine Corps at the time. Yeah. And uh, the gentleman on the right is Colonel Paul Montanus, who was the Special Operations Battalion Commander uh, back in Camp Lejeune that I reported to during the workup exercise, not uh, while we were in Afghanistan. And uh, he was the one that, as far as who's responsible for properly sourcing us and providing the realistic training for where we were going to go, that was his responsibility. Uh, <clears throat> he made some, again, the, the publisher, after reading this book, they decided we want this picture of these two um, as a few bad men. But there's this is not a book on disparaging the United States or the United States Marine Corps. Um, I just last Friday finished serving for more years uh, with the Department of Defense and the Marine Corps uh, as a, in a civilian capacity. I love the Marine Corps. I love the United States. Uh, total combined services over 31 years. And my point is this talks about a few bad men. Right. And uh, it's, it's important to understand who they are and what they did. They say it with their own words in quotes because they said it while under sworn testimony. Unfortunately, uh, so much of that was classified and they, I believe that was done for a reason because it was, it was not done once or twice. It was done over three and a half weeks daily. Uh, yeah. But now it's all been declassified and I have uh, put the names and the faces in the book. Uh, it is the, I believe, of course I'm biased, is one of the most powerful books you should read if you care about our nation's defense and that we may have to be fighting a pure competitor uh, anytime soon in what our American fighting men and women uh, need as far as being set up for success. This type of right. issues should never be allowed to ever happen again in the military history. It always drove me nuts, though, to see, see trigger pullers that would go out and do something and uh, and then next thing you know, they're being brought up on charges. Uh, same deal with being a CO. I, w I you know, hey, you want to put in your name for CO? No. You know, there's just one Marine that goes out and does something. Next thing you know, the CO hits chopped off. It, it, it's it's ridiculous. Some of the you know the uh, the guys from World War II that made things happen um, that would take a Marine that that. You know, say a DUI, you get a Marine, a really good Marine who made an honest, bad mistake. And now we got to kick him out, you know, just because of one or his career's ruined. In your case, you're overshadowed by this entire episode. And yet nobody ever said, thank you very much. Sorry about that. Pat on the back. Oh, by the way, uh, too bad you didn't get promoted to lieutenant colonel. Um, I understand you have a lawsuit going. How's that? Is that actually getting traction or are you? Yes. You I, I, 
You know, I one of the documents that I sent to you, Taco, is a document as a result of a senior civilian officials from the Department of Navy who examined both of these cases, which I just described to you, one from the Marine Special Operations Command and one while I was a, an operations officer with 3rd Reconnaissance Battalion on another deployment in Afghanistan. Uh, the words that they used were not just powerful, but they were explicit. Uh, they used sir, very clear words such as unjust and immoral. They directed the removal, complete removal of all this adverse material that had been put in my records and that I'd be sent to a special selection board. Uh, the result of that special selection board, the, the Marine Corps ignored it for the longest time. And then they said, oh, well, he was not competitive. We're not going to promote him. Um, so this yeah, is you were competitive to enough to be selected to be the first MARSOC guy. Yes. And if you're not that competitive, then how the hell did you get that job? You know, right. We don't have the worst leaders, not just make it to force reconnaissance, but stay there and continue to deploy can again and again and again and serve in multiple force recon commands and then go to MARSOC. And here's a, a, a Marine Corps version of Top Gun instructor. And uh, you've gone to all the schools to include your professional military education. You're not somebody that's fat or unfit. You're, yeah. you're the top product. And it's very clear these generals come back. I'm sure you've heard it, Taco, when they go to these promotion boards and they say, here's the deal. Um, you need to you need to have a high physical fitness score. You need to do your education. You need to get a combat deployment. You need to get a key assignment as an operations officer, executive officer. So you get a joint tour. You got to do that. Yeah. yeah. All these things I had exceeded in, in spades. I did, you know, been on a B billet to, to top gun, Moss yeah. one. Did them all, but the Marine Corps still has this uh, deep-rooted bias. You, I'm sure you've uh, re clearly recall uh, the Marine Corps has this black book. Uh, many people that have one issue or the next, once your name's in, it doesn't get out. You know, yeah. a, Clorox doesn't the get rid of that. The Commandant has a little black book that his JAG, and I happen to know the JAG, um, we'll talk offline, that had that black book for the uh, headquarters or actually yes. had access to it or something. So, yeah, so this is ongoing. Um, it's, it's not the, the daily focus and I'm a employee at Tesla. I, I have a, a clear focus on what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, but, uh, the thing is, is when there is injustice by senior officials, you can't sweep this stuff under the rug. It affects too many people, uh, whether it's some, young Marine, you know, rooting the rear ranks with the rusty rifle, or if it's a four-star general, when you get away with serious offenses, it really emboldens the mind and it makes people think, you know what, I, I can do this again. And right. that type of emboldened mentality that that's what creates repeat offenders. And like I said, Colonel Homiak now, he's, he's the senior Marine at Virginia Military Institute. He's still in circulation. He said, I'm willing to sacrifice the lives of these Marines to me, not just once, but twice. That was uh, not hearsay or conjecture on my part. I took a polygraph from Terrence Victor O'Malley, the late Terrence Victor O'Malley, who was the president of the American Polygraph Association. No deception indicated. It was the cleanest polygraph he'd heard. And uh, the Department of the Navy, senior civilians examined all this and they said, you know what? Uh, then Lieutenant Colonel Homiak has never once, although he's been to court, never, never spoke up about that. He has never answered any questions regarding that. And they believe that also one of the reasons that sent me to uh, the this second trial, the Board of Inquiry, is I wrote, I was so outraged when I came back from Afghanistan on the, the second oh, You wrote uh, a incident. letter that... Yeah. I wrote letters to 88 members of Congress all the members of the House and the Senate Armed Services Committees. I wrote it to my Kansas senators and my district representative. I wrote it. Yeah. Uh, these, these weren't letters. They detailed everything. It was a sworn statement. It included my polygraph. And I sent it to all these individuals in November of 2011. And conveniently, a month later, on Christmas Day, which was a Sunday in 2011, uh, and as you know, 
letters that are written by a three-star general are not uh, mismarked or misdated or misspelled. Uh, that letter was sent, was signed by Lieutenant General Milstead on the 25th of December. So my little Christmas present from Headquarters Marine Corps Deputy Commandant for Manpower and Reserve Affairs was to send me to an involuntary separation board known as a show cause board or board of inquiry, uh, which I stood and, and won. Uh, but uh, when you fight the system and say, hey, uh, this is a serious issue, and you send it to all the members of the House and Senate Armed Services Committee, the inspector general, the uh, every everybody who's in power, and this is called protected communication. When you contact your members of Congress, it's protected communication. But uh, obviously, what I found out over the over the years is when you mention when you send something to your member of Cong Congress, yeah, or a member of the Armed Services Committee, whether it's House or you know bicameral or the President of the United States, you know who gets the copy first? It goes yeah. to the Office of Legislative Affairs yeah. for the system. So if you say you're a veteran and you you have something to beef, it's going to go to the service first. And yeah. they may have a little problem with a, a major on active duty saying that uh, his battalion commander said this, and you have a sworn statement that you, you that you have sent a hard copy to all 88 members um, that you can contact directly through protected communication and the inspector general, and that uh, and you have a polygraph attached to it from the president of polygraph uh, associate American Polygraph Association. So uh, that's what sent me to a, a second trial <laughs> and I won. And, uh, but you, again, your readers, you your get, listeners, you can't, get, you can't get that time back and you can't get the yes. accolades back uh, because you got screwed. Um, <sighs> God, you just can't even, can't even imagine that. You know, it reminds me if you had to watch a movie about incompetence, it would be. Gunny Highway fighting major dickhead in uh, Heartbreak Ridge. You know, the guy, right. he was the supply dude. And, and the, uh, you know, the general's like, right. what'd you do before this? Sir, I was supply. Yeah, you know what? Maybe you ought to go back. Right, um, exactly. It sounds, it sounds like you had a couple of those guys that made it up through there, unfortunately. And yes. uh, that's a damn shame. But, yeah, how do we get back? That's a good question is how do we get back to trust? for our military guys to know that we as senior officers, somebody's got their back and where do you find that trust with folks when you're sitting there trying to promote whatever agenda is the flavor of the month with a rainbow flag somewhere in an organization someplace, um, you know, instead of doing PowerPoints for whatever uh, liberal cause may be out there. Why aren't we war fighting and gaming right. and strategizing and, um, you know, General Berger's stuff of trying to focus on what the real threat is right now and what it will be in the next five years. But uh, how do you fix that? How do you think? Well, uh, and we mentioned before the show, I've been advocating for these three three members of the Marine Special Operations Command who are currently under fire, two Marine gunnies okay. and a corpsman. Uh, you know, one of the, the mainstream media doesn't want to really even discuss this. So we've been trying to connect with mainstream media because what happened was as a black Marine gunnery sergeant was punched in the face twice. Mm -hmm. uh, the gentleman who was 275 pound retired Green Beret is coming in a third time. And another Marine gunnery sergeant came in to protect him punched the assaulter in the face one time. The assaulter fell back, hit his head, was knocked unconscious, and uh, died four days later in uh, Germany where he was evacuated to complications from choking, asphyxiating on his vomit. But uh, these three men, and the reason I bring this up is this is a current case, currently in progress. These guys are still under fire, haven't been cleared. But uh, like I mentioned just again, just a minute ago, that if you've gotten away with these types of abuses of authority, it emboldens people to like, you know what? I'm I'm all powerful. I can do whatever I want. Yeah. And now we have the lives of three three Marine special operators. Two of them are Marines. One's a corpsman, Navy corpsman. Uh, they, they have families, children. 
Uh, they've stopped their proficiency pay. I mean, can you imagine? And just like what's happened to me, I, it was professional destruction. I, I went, I was forced to retire. I retired and I started a business because I applied for 700 jobs. That level, when the papers are continuously like they did in the case of our case, the Marsoc 7 case, uh, and I was the poster boy. I was the Marine officer that walked into the courtroom. His face was plastered all over the papers, alleged of killing and wounding 69 alleged innocent Afghan civilians. So if if America does, if, if they sit back and take a relax and just forget about it, this stuff will continue and we will have a military akin to what Russia has that has suffers from low morale, where those on the front line foot soldiers realize that the senior officers don't have their backs, that they're lying to the, the people back in Russia about what's really going on there. Uh, read the book. You'll see, I mean, was the American public clearly told what was going on? You'll see that there will be things in that book you've never, ever heard of, but they're quoted. And this has gone through the Pentagon Office of Prepublication or Security Review. If they wanted to try to kick me out as an officer on a pension, which I am, uh, you, you can't divulge any classified information. You can't uh, say anything right. untrue or they can bring you back. Um, and there's no statute of limitations for officer misconduct. So they, if anything was false or in there, they would have uh, came after me before it even was published and shut me down. Uh, what about but, like Greg Kelly or, you know, he's a Harrier pilot uh, on Newsmax. Or Sean if Hannity. Contacts, we'd love to get. We've reached out to everybody. We have. I have two publicists right now who are uh, actively trying to engage every member of the media possible. Uh, the publication dates the seventh of June, so it's very important that readers are aware of this. Read this. Uh, there's plenty of stuff. I mean, I've been in hundreds of. I'm not boasting. I'm just stating fact. Hundreds of media appearances. The military has never debated a single word from a single. Uh, media appearance and omni-channel media on internet, print, uh, mm -hmm. I've done congressional testimonies. Uh, so, but this, this is a very serious matter. Again, it affects the largest employer that we have in, in our nation. And uh, those who have raised their right hand, sworn to defend our nation, and who will in the future answer our country's call, deserve competent commanders, deserve moral commanders, and they deserve the best. Uh, right now, you read this book, you'll find out like we, Houston, we have some problems here yeah. and they have to get fixed. Uh, you have to contact your member of Congress after you read this book and say, we have a serious issue. You know, all it takes in the Marine Corps is to have the two, I mean, this isn't social media, but as long as the two people above you like you, you know, that's really all it takes is your two people above you, but all your people below you, you can just literally, as done in our case, you can destroy them. And uh, you had one officer that says, I'm willing to sacrifice. I mean, that's a, it's pretty unethical words. Uh, I mean, I am somebody who's fought in combat personally as a force recon platoon commander doing direct action raids, hundreds of them in the worst places in the world. And I realized that my life may have been required of me on any of those missions, but I still have a huge problem when somebody says, casually i'm willing to sacrifice when yeah. we have other options that don't require you to to blow your own marines up and yeah. then afterwards covered up by not even allowing them to be medically screened which is there's a protocol that they have to be medically screened before they go back to the united states and then when they get back to the united states they have to be screened again uh, but this whole thing was whitewashed and a marine died needlessly and yet you get brought up on charges and nothing happens to anybody else. No. This is amazing. Yes, uh, you know what? And that's the, the thing that the that's readers will, your listeners will, and the readers of this book will hear that they got away with this. All these leaders, these few bad men, 100% yeah. of them got promoted and they got away with this. Has like Jocko, none of them. Jocko Wilnick, has, has Jocko's people reached out to you? Actually, I personally reached out to Jocko several times and I hope he contacts me back. These, uh, uh, this book will go viral. Uh, people will talk about it. And hopefully those who are veterans, especially from the special operations community, get the, you know, a, this is a big story that affects everybody and let's not ignore it. 
Um, so I don't know why. Uh, I'm well, sure I'll put a plea out there. Me. Joe Rogan, Jocko, you guys are the, the giants that we, we sit there and look up yes. to. Yeah, you know, in terms of reaching audiences and I mean great interviews. Jocko is one of my heroes when it comes to that, and so is Joe Rogan. But if we can get folks out there to publicize this, maybe somebody's got a brother's cousin's uncle who works over there with them. Uh Tim Pool, any of those guys, we need to get your story aired. Hey, listen, I've kept you for an hour and a half and I can't thank you enough for for hanging out. Uh, next time you come out to Fort Worth, please bring your nephew with you and let me take care of him. We'll go out and have some fun. Will do. I told him hey. about uh, your collection today and he's very excited to see uh, <laughs> your, your armored in uh, tactical vehicles. That's That was awesome. Thank oh, you yeah. very and much. Hey, nothing, nothing like driving through Chick-fil-A and the uh, Fox, man. We'll go have some fun. I tell you what, yes. if you hang out for a minute, I'm going to say goodbye, wrap this up, and I'll be right back with you, okay? Fair enough. All right. Hey, folks, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Tall Tales with Taco Bell. If you like it, share, subscribe. If you know Joe Rogan, you know Tim Pool, you know Jocko. Uh, if you know any of those top podcasters, get his information over. Uh, let me know. You got to tell him that they've got to get Fred on the show to talk about this stuff because I've met him personally, and I tell you what, I'd serve under him and for him any day and twice on Sunday, twice, because that's the kind of guy he is. So until I see you guys next week, adios, hasta luego, sabidiz en chus, sheshini, au revoir. Domar gato gozamis tan no shinde, kudasai chao, rivedici, tashikur, assalam alikum, salam, mahala, dasvidanya, and nastrovia. You guys have a great night, and we will see you next Tuesday out here.